Pastor Terrell Fletcher, <clears throat> pastor of the City of Hope International Church in Southeast San Diego. I'm honored and I'm privileged to be um, able to be your last speaker um, of this day. Uh, there aren't many great outcomes that came from the COVID-19 quarantine, but if I had to find a silver lining, it was in the fact that we were all forced to be at home, forced to turn on the news stations, sports stations, um, other types of TV stations that we watch. And we were forced to watch a black man be murdered. And we were not allowed to leave our homes to turn away from it. And like a sick horror flick, you want to turn away but you have to look and see what the outcome is gonna be. And that's what happened when George Floyd died. On the corner, like an animal. And we watched it. And we're debating whether that was sickening or not. We're debating whether, we, whether he deserved to have rights or not. And in this moment, for a few seconds, Let's not focus that he was a black man. But did you see a man die? Did you see a fellow human being asphyxiate for eight and a half minutes? How do we feel good about that? What is up for debate with that? And I just happen to also be a black man. And I view the fact that this gentleman or this man well, this murderer could have a badge and could have the power that's associated with this badge to be a part of a higher systemic problem. And if it's systemic, then it means that Minnesota is not just the place that I should worry about. Every place that the system is operating should be shaking in their boots because it leaves too many men that look like me dead. And you can choose not to believe in systemic racism and you can choose not to believe in privilege, and you can choose not to believe that some people are wired to believe that they're greater and more superior than others, but you'd be wrong. You can choose all you want to believe what you want to believe, but I'm grateful that we have a righteous God that eventually exposes all lies, and people like you and like me have to one day reckon with the reality of truth, the truth that some of us in society operate under the idea of white supremacy. And let's not make a mistake about it, racism is a symptom of white supremacy. White supremacy is the idea that because I am Anglo-Saxon or because I am white or because I've chosen to buy into the covenants and the secrets and to not tell all the stuff I'm privileged to have because I've chosen to be a part of that, because you've chosen to be a part of that, you're some kind of way better than everybody else. That's not that. And that's evil. And the outcomes of supremacy are racism. And we get to deny racism because we don't want to talk about supremacy. And the truth and the reality of these matters is that for people like me and for my son, and for my three brothers, and for many black men that look like me. We run like the gazelle every day, hoping that the lion doesn't catch us, hoping that this is just a good cop that's gonna give me a ticket for speeding and not one that's gonna pull me over, try me and execute me on the sidewalk. So you have to forgive my emotions today, but I'm grateful to have some of my white colleagues stand here with me today because me and my black colleagues and my other people of color, we do this every summer. We are here two, three times a year and we are, we are cried out. Our voice is a horse and the reality of the matter, white pastor, 
white bishop, white reverend, the average racist don't go to my church. The average racist is in your congregation. The white supremacist is sitting on your deacon board. And I am challenging you as a man or woman of God to call it out and to call it what it is and to stand in your moral courage and stand in your moral strength so that you can help your fellow human being. And don't use your pulpits to create more calm because calm is why we're back here again this summer. Our churches subdue problems instead of expose them and deal with them. Our churches put us down and sit us down with lights and with music instead of calming it down and speaking truth to power, which will rile up the righteous indignation in the people that are in our audiences. We have to become again the first century church that turned the world upside down because we refused to allow injustices like this to be calm and washed under the water. My challenge to you is not something that's new. One of the strongest women in American history understood what I'm trying to say because I'm not advocating anything violent. I'm not advocating public disruption, but I'm advocating making decisions that will agitate the spirit and the soul of man so that we can see things played out in real life. It makes no mind for us to read these reforms if we all leave this press conference subdued and not fired up to see them all the way through. But in 1955, a young man named Emmett Till was sent to Mississippi on vacation to spend time with his family. It was said that he whistled at a white woman who later admitted that the event never happened. But nonetheless, that was apparently a capital offense in Mississippi at the time. They grabbed this young boy, they killed him, they murdered him, they threw him in a river, and it took quite a while for them to find him. When they eventually found him, he was bloated, had barbed wire around his neck, they sent him back to Chicago and the, the coroner and the funeral owner said to his mother, he looks so bad, we have to close the casket. And his mother looked at the funeral owner and said, absolutely not. She said, we'll have an open casket funeral. And it's not because I want his murderers to see what they did to my boy because they're probably not going to watch the funeral. It says it's because I want people to see what we're capable of doing to one another. She said it's because I want this to make people of goodwill be outraged enough to do something about it. And to all my churches that are ready to just close the casket and move on. Unfortunately, we don't have the luxury as black men to fight for our right for our churches to be open. We're fighting for our right to be alive and to live. And to that I say, deal with what's uncomfortable and don't close the casket yet. Let the people of goodwill and righteousness stand up and feel the agitation and not just write reforms on paper, but be active participants in seeing them come to pass. God bless you. I just think we should close on those words, not closing the casket, but keeping it open and moving forward together and understanding that the call of the gospel and the call of our faith for each and every one of us in our congregations and personally and individually is to change, to transform, to renew, because it is God who compels us. Amen.
Thank you for being with us today. We have several clergy who will be available for interviews after this. Thank you for your time. And thank you all, all of you that are here today with us uh, for spending such a powerful moment together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.